contrary to the rumors that you've heard, I was not born in a manger. I was actually born on Krypton and sent here to save the planet Earth. We cannot continue to rely only on our military in order to achieve the national security objectives that we've set. Everybody somewhere between the ages of 18 and 25 will serve three months of basic training. We've got to have a civilian national security force that's just as powerful, just as strong. Yes, we can. Obama South Carolina plan will include coverage of all essential medical services. Yes, we can. Obama is a cruel hoax. He works for Wall Street. He's an agent of finance capital. Where did you come up with the number $700 billion? Here's the uh, Treasury spokeswoman's quote. It's not based on any particular data point. We just really wanted to come up with a really big number. To Democrats and Republicans who've opposed this plan, I say, step up to the plate. A few members were even told that there would be martial law in America if we voted no. Secretary Henry Paulson is no George Washington. I don't think anyone questions, Mr. Kashkari, that you're working hard. Our question is who you're working for. Obama pledged that he would resume the security and prosperity partnership talks between Mexico and Canada that President Bush initiated. The old boss is starting to look a lot like the new boss. Robert Gates is going to remain on the job as defense secretary for at least a year. Plenty of sources knew about this meeting, uh, told us and others that it was at Hillary Clinton's house, but clearly uh, it wasn't. We've got to give them a stake in creating the kind of uh, uh, world order that I think all of us would like to see. We see you causing a depression so you can blow out the economy and consolidate it and bankrupt it. We know that you are enemies of free humanity and we are here standing against your tyranny. The Obama deception, the truth strikes back. Barack is like the manager of Burger King. All presidents are including Bush. It's like this, when your fries are cold, if your burger is not done right, you go back to Burger King, America, or your government, and you say, my burger's cold, I want new fries. First, you go to the cashier, that's the courts. You argue to the courts. The courts, if you can't get no justice with the cashier, you say, let me see the manager. I want to go to the Supreme Court. I want to see the president. The manager comes out. Hi, what can I do for you? Now the manager can override the decisions of the cashier. But you never get to see the franchise owner a Burger King. If you really have a problem with your burger, you need to go see the franchise owner. We need to go to the top or to the bottom. <laughs> we need to go to where the real architecture of government is. And it's not in a precedent. It's in a global scheme. Politics in America today is identical to pro wrestling. And what I mean by that is, in front of the cameras and the public, we all hate each other. I'm going to kick my opponent's butt, I'm going to wail him from here to high water and beat the crap out of him. Yet behind the scenes, we all have friends going out to dinner. Went to dinner together. And, and, and it's all a work. All intermarried. Show business. It's show biz. And that's what you have today in politics. The Democrats and Republicans aren't really opposed to each other. Left and right mean nothing. The only thing that counts is, are you working for Wall Street or are you trying to defend the people against the financiers? It's pretty obvious that there's some gigantic financial institutions that have been pulling the strings of politicians in this country for a long time. And the, the, just the fact that we have it set up where they can donate millions of dollars to these guys' funds, these guys' campaigns. I mean, how do we not expect it, it all to go bad? America in 2009 was desperate for change. 
The past eight years have been a disaster. Those weapons of mass destruction got to be somewhere. <laughs> Maybe under here. <laughs> George W. Bush, who had claimed to be a conservative, had tripled the size of the federal government, shredded the Constitution, and destroyed the image of the United States worldwide. Nope, no weapons over there. <laughs> Endless wars, over a million dead Iraqis, and more than 5,000 dead U.S. troops. The Patriot Act warrantless domestic wiretapping and spying. The end of Posse Comitatus. The rise of the treasonous North American Union. A deepening recession, sliding towards total economic collapse. These factors and other abuses had the American people in a state of panic for their future and the very existence of the United States. The elite were in trouble. The people were beginning to see through their facade, past their front man, and to the ruling elite behind the throne. For the first time in U.S. history, both parties were universally hated. Congress had a 9% approval rating. The globalist agenda had stalled. And then, onto the scene came a man who promised change. Change we could all believe in. Barack H. Obama promised to end the war and bring our troops home fast. He pledged to uphold the Constitution and to stop the federal government from spying on the American people. Candidate Obama told American workers that he was going to get them out of NAFTA and GATT. And he's already breaking those promises. In this film, we will prove that Obama says one thing and does another, and that he works for the very same elite interests that Bush served. The very interest engineering the financial collapse and formation of a dictatorial world government. This film is not about left or right. It is nonpartisan. Our past documentary films are among some of the most damning indictments of George W. Bush and his administration that have ever been made. If humanity has any hope of affecting real change for the better, it will not come from the Madison Avenue false reality makers who have cast Barack Obama as the savior of the world. To alter our course from tyranny to liberty, to defeat the corrupt elite, we must get past the puppets and confront the real power structure of the planet. Now we can see a new world coming into view. A world in which there is the very real prospect of a new world order. Webster Griffin Tarpley is an accomplished geopolitical analyst and historian. Among his scholarly works are the unauthorized biographies of George Herbert Walker Bush and Barack Hussein Obama. Since Bush the Elder made his speech at the United Nations back in September of 1990 talking about the new world order, I think I've become confused about what's actually going on in the world. The new world order is a more palatable name for the Anglo-American world empire. It's the planetary domination of London, New York, Washington, over the rest of the world. It's hard to get people to join that or think they have a part in it if you call it the Anglo-American world empire. If you call it the New World Order, then people in India or someplace like that or the European Union might think, well, there's something in that for us too. But that's not what it is. It's the Anglo-American New World Order. It's really the old world order. It's the British Empire morphing into the American Empire. The U.S.-British world empire is, is what you're going to get. Combines of powerful men have always battled with each other over the levers of power. Gerald Salente is recognized as one of the world's foremost trends forecasters and as the founder of the Trends Research Institute. People that are knowledgeable know that the fight that this country has been waging since its inception is for the central bankers not to take over the country. And that's why people like Andrew Jackson were elected. And that's why people revere people like Thomas Jefferson and others. The takeover has happened. And it's a corporate takeover. 
Agents of the Bank of England attempted to assassinate President Andrew Jackson on multiple occasions because of his resistance against a private central bank being set up in the United States. And it was something that Abraham Lincoln warned. And this is, by the way, why I believe he was assassinated. This is the Lincoln quote. The money powers prey upon the nation in times of peace and conspire against it in times of adversity. It is more despotic than monarchy, more insolent than autocracy, more selfish than bureaucracy. I see in the near future a crisis approaching that unnerves me and causes me to tremble for the safety of my country. Corporations have been enthroned. An era of corruption will follow and the money power of the country will endeavor to prolong its reign by working upon the prejudices of the people until the wealth is aggregated in a few hands and the republic is destroyed. Wall Street has killed Main Street. So I know how unpopular it is to be seen as helping banks right now, especially when everyone is suffering in part from their bad decisions. I promise you, I get it. Up until about the Kennedy assassination and the beginning of the war in Vietnam, the United States is a very powerful engine for world progress. It's the assassinations, the Kennedy assassination, and the others in the 1960s, the beginning of the Vietnam War, and the beginning of the absolute domination of the Wall Street group over every other interest. Nobody else counts except the Wall Street money masters. That has now made the United States into uh, no longer a force for progress, but something very different, often a force for destruction in the world. The military-industrial complex has taken over the country along with the Wall Street gang. If you look also at the people that Obama has put on his appointments list, it's all Wall Street. It's government of Wall Street, by Wall Street, and for Wall Street. There's nobody from heavy industry. There's nobody from the auto sector. Nobody from Silicon Valley. Nobody from big oil. Nobody from defense. No labor. No women. No retirees. No small business. Nothing. It's pure Wall Street. The only people who have a voice in Obama's councils are Wall Street finance oligarchs. That's all there is. Nobody else counts for anything under Obama. It's the most extreme Wall Street administration we've ever had. Before his death, President Woodrow Wilson apologized to the public, regretting that he had been deceived by a group of international bankers and the country's financial system had fallen into their iron grip via the Federal Reserve Act of 1913. Whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. Dwight D. Eisenhower, he warned the people that the military-industrial complex was taking over the country. Only three years after leaving office, President Eisenhower's prophetic warning concerning the threat posed to our system of government by the military-industrial complex came to pass. President John F. Kennedy had enraged the entire elite network. Now Kennedy was brought in as somebody who was expected to be a puppet. It was thought that his pro-Nazi father, Joseph P. Kennedy, the bootlegger, the speculator, would uh, guarantee that Kennedy would be obedient to the establishment. They thought that Kennedy was a sex maniac who could be manipulated through all of this, but it turned out that through his personal suffering, Kennedy had discovered a personal sense of himself which went beyond just being a puppet, and he began to think about things like economic recovery, world peace, having a space program, uh, making deals with uh, the Soviets, cutting the uh, Federal Reserve down to size, and a whole series of other things. Executive Order Number 11110 signed by President Kennedy, began the process of abolishing the private Federal Reserve. Kennedy was also pushing for real civil rights reform and had begun the process of pulling the troops out of Vietnam. The last time you had an actual president was uh, Kennedy. The oligarchs took swift and decisive action. When John Kennedy attempted to take the government back from the robber barons, he was brutally murdered. The message to future U.S. presidents and leaders across the world was clear. Do as you're told or die. John Fitzgerald Kennedy was the last true president of the United States. And until the globalists are removed from power, we will never have another real one. 
The other thing about the American presidency, you've got to remember, is that this is a puppet post. It's automatically going to be a puppet post. The idea that Obama is somebody who is going to come in and exercise real authority, when he's obviously been chosen and given everything that he's got by these financiers. Presidents are now little more than corporate pitch men who take all the political heat while the controllers remain in the shadows, safe from public scrutiny. Hip-hop icon KRS-One is not just known for selling millions of albums. He has led a tireless crusade against youth violence and has been a strong voice for human rights. If they controlled it before, what are you, why don't, what makes you think they're not controlling it now? The country was on a verge of revolution. They threw a black man up. Now we like this. They give him the money. They give him the bundling. They give him vote fraud. They give him the media whores. They give him goons. They even have elected officials making threats to put people in jail if they criticize Obama in public. All of this is the mark of a puppet. Uh, and that means that he is uh, a puppet, actually more of a puppet than anybody else, more of a puppet than Mrs. Clinton would have been, even more of a puppet than, than McCain. He's the maximum puppet that we've had certainly since, since Jimmy Carter. They put a black face on the New World Order, and now we all happy. KRS ain't buying it. In the real executive power structure, the president serves the military-industrial complex. It's cell-phoned by the international bankers. If there's a revolution, the population just throws out the prime minister or president. The elite stays in power because the public is never aware of who the real enemy is. In Evian, France in 1991, standing before the Bilderberg Group, the apex of the world government power structure, David Rockefeller defined the New World Order as a system of world government serving the international banking elite. For decades, the banker-owned media would attack anyone who dared to warn the public that a dictatorial world government was being constructed right under their nose, and that national sovereignty was being deliberately destroyed. And now, after years of denial, the media and the elite themselves are proudly announcing that not only is world government real, but it is the answer to the financial crisis that they carefully engineered. Suddenly, the Wall Street Journal tells us that the North American Union is here and that getting rid of the dollar for a common currency with Canada and Mexico is good. The Financial Times of London, published by a member of the Bilderberg Group, crowed that a dictatorial world government had been kept in the shadows for our own good and that it was now time for it to emerge from behind the curtains of national security. White House Chief of Staff Rahm Emanuel stated on record that they can't let this crisis go to waste. You never want a serious crisis to go to waste. And what I mean by that, it's an opportunity to do things that you think you could not do before. And Henry Kissinger, who gave Barack Obama his first job out of college, told national television that the economic collapse was a great opportunity to bring in the New World Order. He went on to say that Barack Obama was the perfect person to sell it to the world. Uh, but he can give a new impetus to American foreign policy, partly because the reception of him is so extraordinary around the world. I think his task will be to develop an overall strategy for America in this period, when really a new world order can be created. It's a great opportunity. It isn't just a crisis. In June of 2006, our team traveled to Ottawa, Canada to gather intelligence on the shadow government's agenda for the coming years. I think that's the Queen! Investigative journalist and best-selling author Daniel Estelin had been tracking the Bilderberg Group for more than 16 years. His moles inside Bilderberg informed him that the elite were planning to first run the price of gas up to $150 a barrel, unimaginable in 2006. He also reported that after suckering the middle class back into the stock market, the group was going to implode the subprime mortgage market and destroy public confidence. Well, one of the things that you know we're getting from this morning in this afternoon's conference, this morning conference was about the. Uh, the, the energy crisis, the press of oil, this, the afternoon conference, which started about 4 o'clock, 4, 4.30, they were talking about 
uh, one of the American delegates, I, I wasn't told who exactly it was, was talking about the uh, <coughs> the concern that the American citizens have had with the, with, you know, with the housing prices going down, so they're not investing that money. So what they needed to do is they needed to create the illusion that everything is going well. So what they're going to do over the next year, year and a half, is to bring the market back up to 1998, 1999 levels. They're going to get all the suckers to invest whatever little money they have left over, <coughs> and that's when they're going to make the economy bottom drop out. They need to destroy the economy because as we're running out of oil, when people don't travel, at least that's what they're saying, when people don't travel, when people don't have money, they don't travel, they don't spend any money, which means you don't waste a lot of uh, 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 oil and natural gas. That's the afternoon so conversation. how does this source, I mean, just ballpark, I mean, so, so you have the sources of... Well, actually, they're two people uh, who are members of the Bilderberg Club. It's actually members. They're members of, they're members of the Bilderberg Club who, for years and years and years, have been going and participating in all the conversations. They've always been dead on, always. And last year they said the oil prices are going to go up to 150. At the time it was 39, went up to 76, yeah. basically doubled. If it doubles again, it's going to be back to where these people They attack Iran and will it us. Year after year, Estelin and other reporters like Jim Tucker are able to report on future events with stunning accuracy. All because they know the agenda of the Bilderberg Group. The Bilderberg Group sits at the top of the world power structure. 125 of the richest and most influential individuals on the globe make up its membership. From Istanbul, Turkey to Chantilly, Virginia, we have tracked the elusive Bilderberg Group. Bilderberg always insists on a media black. By June of 2008, we had already figured out that Barack Obama was the elite's puppet of choice. The national media claimed that during the weekend the Bilderberg Group was scheduled to meet, that Obama had speaking engagements set for Chicago and the Midwest. We knew better. In a classic bait-and-switch, the Obama campaign told the press corps to get on Obama's campaign plane and that Obama would join them on the flight to Chicago. Campaign staff then slammed the door shut. The fawning press had been shanghaied as Obama's campaign aircraft lifted off without Obama. Robert, why were we not told about this meeting and that the senator wouldn't be on our flight until the doors were shut and we were about to taxi to take off? Again, uh, 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 you know, uh, we had a desire, Senator Obama had a desire to do some meetings. Others had a desire to meet with him tonight in a private way, and that's what we're doing. And we set up these meetings. They're being they're being done tonight. Again, I, I'm. I, is there more than one meeting? Is there more than one person? With whom I'm not going to get into all the details of the meetings. I, I I don't know that I've got a ton more different answers for all of your questions. Obama wasn't going to Chicago. He had a meeting to attend. A secret meeting. Initially, it was believed that the secret meeting took place at Clinton's Washington, D.C. home. Obama's spokesman denied that, but won't confirm where the former rivals met. He also declined to comment on their topics of discussion. For a day and a half, the mainstream media engaged in a wild goose chase, trying to find out where Hillary and Obama had gone. Three cover stories later, the corporate press had to admit they had no idea where the two candidates had gone. And to this day, Clinton and Obama aren't talking. Plenty of sources knew about this meeting, uh, told us and others that it was at Hillary Clinton's house, but clearly uh, it wasn't. In 2008, the trail led us to the Westfields Marriott Hotel, right outside Washington, D.C. We just flew into Washington, D.C. We're driving to the Westfields Marriott. Tomorrow the hotel's closed throughout the week and the weekend for the Bilderberg Group meeting. But we're going to check in the night before. They're going to kick us out tomorrow. So we're going directly into the belly of the beast. The hotel will be filled with at least five spy agencies. CIA, Defense Intelligence, Mossad, uh, European Union Security. We checked into the Westfields Marriott 48 hours before hotel guests were scheduled to be thrown out ahead of the annual meeting. The building was nestled in the heart of the military-industrial complex, with the National Reconnaissance Office and Raytheon just a stone's throw away.
The plan tonight is to try to not get arrested, dodge the security, get in there, get some some footage of the elite arriving in the morning because some arrive before they officially lock it down and then getting out of the building. Uh, that's our plan. I'm also going to be uh, getting a call by a uh, international a syndicated radio show, Coast to Coast AM with George Norrie, and all week he's getting briefings from me every night uh, about things as they develop. George, we're sitting here in the room. As the phone rings with your producer, Tom Danheiser, to put me on, the fire alarm goes off. Uh, so everybody is exiting the building. I know this is a setup. They timed it exactly when this happened. Open the door. I wanted to hear the fire alarm. Open the door. I want people to hear this live to, to the you know, 16 million people listening. George, do you hear that? Now, 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 they're going to use this as an excuse. The Westfield Marriott, right outside D.C. in Chantilly, they want to use this to flush us out of here. They're very upset. Everybody that covers Bilderberg, I was detained two years ago, interrogated, screamed at. They said Bilderberg was upset about me, wanted to stop us. Uh, this is guaranteed. Everywhere we go, we're followed. We have another hotel across town as a base of operations. They were there uh, questioning us, getting in our faces. We're being followed everywhere. I need everybody's support right now. I pray to God they don't try to set me up. They may have tried to concoct this as some way to say, you know, look, they didn't leave during a fire drill, assessing me knowing I would stay and do the interview. But again, the moment the phone rang with Tom Danheiser, uh, the moment the phone rang, the guys answered it, I'm standing there, the alarm goes off, uh, it's going off right now, the guests are exiting the hotel out there, of course there's no fire. Uh, this is just absolutely insane. I noticed, too, that there was... Over 100 security people here today, but tonight we got back and it was a total ghost town. And this is what's insane. We have a security guy walk up to us 30 minutes ago, about 25 minutes ago, before this happened. And said, what are you guys doing? We said, we're just walking around checking out the artwork in the hotel, which we actually were admiring. But we were also going around getting some footage. And uh, they said, well, no cameras allowed. We said, fine. And then he said, yeah, we had somebody do a fire alarm a few weeks ago. And me and Rob, my camera guy, were going, why is he telling us about a fire alarm? I forgot that part, George. These bastards have done this. I don't know how they're planning to try to set us up or something, but this is incredible. We are here in the middle of this right now, George. Stay there. Keep it locked. Let's go. Let's get out of here now, Richard. Don't screw around anymore. We got out of here on exactly the right time. Is this the way out? turns and the six turns the same car is following us and uh, now he looks like he's following us into a he, he came out of Bilderberg he came out of the Westfield being a little bit subtle but not too so there he is that's him over there that in the blue green, car yeah. yeah back to the Marriott here in Chantilly, Virginia, the scene of Bilderberg 2008. We successfully infiltrated the last day and a half inside, got out with some great stuff. We've been tailed, and uh, now we're going back to cover the dignitaries, the elitist, as they arrive. And right now is the prime time for them to start arriving for the next three or four hours. We took about a 30-minute break. I'm sure we missed a few, but it doesn't matter. So we've got scores of people that just organically are listeners, info warriors that are out here taking action. And we're going to be out here for the next three days. The 
while you try to chart the future of our destiny. We're taking our destiny back. You're not our gods or our masters. We witnessed at least seven convoys of armed secret service entering the Westfields Marriott, and internal sources confirmed that both candidates did attend at least one meeting inside the conference. While the Bilderberg Group was 100% successful in 2008 at keeping their name out of the mainstream media, they did not fare as well when it came to the exploding independent press. During the entire two-day event, anti-New World Order protesters and alternative media encircled the hotel. You are being exposed everywhere, from David Rockefeller, from John Edwards, from Bill Clinton. Your game of secrecy is over! This You're going to play a game of the close to you piece of trash! This is Bernanke, man! Bernanke, you're going down! Obama, we know you're here, Obama. Schedule for the next three days. We know you're in Virginia. Arch criminals! New World Order scum! We are not your slave scum! Brave Americans came from all over the United States and bullhorned the main conference hall at close range as the global power brokers schemed inside. The global elite are desperate to keep their organizational meetings a secret. They are keenly aware that if the population discovers that policy is being developed covertly by powerful special interest, the people will revolt. It is our duty to expose these criminals. It's a criminal act uh, under federal law for our federal officials to have private meetings to discuss world policy uh, with uh, non uh, non-federal workers. So everybody from the State Department, Treasury Department, White House, Defense Department, and others who show up, as they always do, they're committing a criminal act simply by being here to attend a secret meeting with officials from other countries to, to discuss U.S. policy in the world. Literally, it's a criminal act. And every newspaper, every broadcaster has a patriotic duty to expose these scum and the uh, evil they, pro they project. The election primaries served as a great diversion while the true future course of the nation was being set behind closed doors. We've got obviously the Bilderberger group founded by the former Nazi uh, Prince Bernard of Holland. You've got the Trilateral Commission founded by David Rockefeller's Big New Brzezinski. They're the ones who ran the Carter administration, everybody in the Carter administration from Carter and Mondale and Volcker and Brzezinski were all members of the Trilateral Commission. Founding member of rap sensation Public Enemy, Professor Griff gave us his view of the Obama phenomenon. Barack Obama's been given a pass by the Blue Bloods. He's been given the okay by certain secret societies for them to let him in. I truly believe um, imperialism and fascism needs a facelift. Uh, and a facelift is going to have to be black. And the, the reason why I believe that is simply because um, I think they, they, they're trying to go into Africa. Well, they're already in Africa. But they want to totally control all the natural minerals uh, that they're going to need to carry themselves into the 21st, 22nd, and 23rd centuries. Mm -hmm. uh, you follow me? So I think well, they, they, they have to go through a phase of galvanizing the masses of dark-skinned people that truly believe that change needs to come. But... The change that they're talking about is not necessarily change for the better as far as the masses of the people. Mm -hmm. It's probably a better change for them. It's not going to change for us, right. the little man on a totem pole. And no one looks at the agenda. No, no as long as he that. positions himself right, have the right tie on, have the right smile, um, uh, repeats the slogans over and over and drives it and drives it home, the average, the average American is just going to swallow it hook, line, and sinker. And we don't even know what the agenda is. Writing in his 1964 book with no apologies, Senator Barry Goldwater said, The Trilateral Commission is intended to be the vehicle for multinational consolidation of the commercial and banking interest by seizing control of the political government of the United States. 
the Trilateral Commission represents a skillful, coordinated effort to seize control and consolidate the four centers of power, political, monetary, intellectual, and ecclesiastical. What the Trilateral Commission intends is to create a worldwide economic power superior to the political governments of the nation-states involved. As managers and creators of the system, they will rule the future. Bilderberg issues executive decisions and prime directives to its sub-directors for implementation. The Trilateral Commission takes the Bilderberg Group agenda and executes it through regional roundtable groups throughout Europe, Asia, and the Americas. The Council on Foreign Relations serves as the managing roundtable group in the United States sector. The Council on Foreign Relations has dominated every administration since the days of FDR. The way in which they make policy and rule is that they are a polycentric oligarchical system. You have to be a finance oligarch. Remember, this is not a society ruled by generals, not by priests, not by bureaucrats, not by demagogues, none of those, but by bankers. Bankers rule, and the bankers set up these institutions. They set up things modeled on the Royal Institute for International Affairs, Chatham House, and the Milner Round Table of the period right after the uh, Boer War, so even before World War I. You had the British setting up these round tables, institutes with publications and conferences, and this is how they make policy. Upon Obama's inauguration, members of the Bilderberg Group, Trilateral Commission, and CFR flooded into every position of power in the executive branch, replacing Trilateral Commission and CFR members who previously filled the positions during the Bush administration. When you look at the uh U.S. ruling class, you'd have to say that they're a really pathetic bunch of failures and bunglers. They are a miserable excuse for a ruling class. And that's one of the big problems we have, is you go from Clinton to Bush to Obama. What stays the same is the ruling elite that gives these puppets the orders that they act on. And these orders are uh, wrong-headed, let's say, to say the least. They're basically bankrupt. They're going to lead to the collapse of this civilization. What they're doing is using the existence of the United States as a formerly powerful nation state to act out their Wall Street fantasies of world domination and maintaining their capital structures and maintaining their system of looting. And this can't be done. So the basic question is, they've hijacked our country and you've got to take it back from them. You've got to drive Wall Street out of the government and at that point you have a reasonable chance of getting back to prosperity and some kind of peace and order in international affairs. We had a chance to speak with economist and author George Humphrey. They have created a power elite. We're not talking about your, your the, the millionaire down the street. You can't even be a member of their club unless you're a multi-billionaire. And friends, this is not about rich versus poor. This is about a very, very small handful of, of the worst criminal element on this planet manipulating and destroying the good people of this nation and of this world. About this Obama with change. Look at the people he's put in to mastermind the economic recovery. Larry Summers. I love it. Every time they talk about Larry Summers, he's always brilliant. He's another brilliant one. He's the one that helped dismantle the Glass-Steagall Act, the banking act that was put in place in the 1930s, so the banks couldn't get become the banksters that they become. In the 1990s, you had the beginning of the derivatives bubble, thanks to people like Alan Greenspan, Reuben Summers, a lot of the people who are now back in the Obama administration. And the derivatives, I think, are the centerpiece of this entire problem today. These are the same people, Geithner, from the Treasury Department. Could you imagine that? The US, now we have the U.S. Treasury Secretary, who also is a Robert Rubin protege of the Larry Summers Group, that dismantled Glass-Steagall and, and broke apart the regulations that would have prohibited the banks and brokerages from becoming these criminals. He was the former president of the New York Federal Reserve, and now he's our Treasury Secretary. And as we all know, the Federal Reserve is as federal as Federal Express. It's a private bank. 
and now we've put this guy in charge of it? I mean, can't the wa Wall Street has hijacked Washington in broad daylight? Every single one of his appointments support the status quo. Every one of his appointments are there to screw the American people. Every single one of his appointments are people who are working to bring down the Republic and the Constitution of this country. Secretary of the Treasury, Timothy Geithner, Bilderberg Group and Trilateral Commission member. Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, is a Bilderberg and CFR member. She is also married to Trilateral Commission member, William Jefferson Clinton. Ambassador to the United Nations, Susan Rice, Trilateral Commission. National Security Advisor General James L. Jones, Bilderberg, Trilateral Commission, and CFR. Deputy National Security Advisor Thomas Donnellan, Trilateral Commission, CFR. Special State Department Envoy Henry Kissinger, Bilderberg Group, Trilateral Commission, and CFR. Chairman, Economic Recovery Committee, Paul Volcker, Bilderberg Group, Trilateral Commission, Council on Foreign Relations. The Director of National Intelligence, Admiral Dennis C. Blair, Bilderberg Group, Trilateral Commission, CFR. Secretary of Defense Robert Gates, Bilderberg Group, Trilateral Commission, CFR. Deputy Secretary of State, James Steinberg, Bilderberg Group, Trilateral Commission, CFR. State Department Special Envoy, Richard Haas, Bilderberg Group, Trilateral Commission, and President of the CFR. Obama Presidential Advisor, Alan Greenspan, Bilderberg Group, Trilateral Commission, CFR. State Department Special Envoy, Richard C. Holbrook, Bilderberg, Trilateral, CFR. And the list goes on and on. Even if Barack Obama were the most wonderful person in the world, he was groomed and brought to power by the global elite to carry out their agenda. Humanity must look past Obama and realize that presidents come and go, but the shadow government and their program of global enslavement continues. How could people be so stupid and gullible to believe a bunch of political people? So people who voted for Obama were trying to express, I think, first of all, something worthwhile. The hatred for Bush, Cheney, the neocons, the desire to punish the Republicans for their adventures, their police state, uh, and their economic depression. The second question was on the economy. People felt that uh, Bush was selling them down the river into a world depression. He is, of course, the new Herbert Hoover in that regard. So they were trying to get something different from that. The tragedy, of course, is, and this is really why Obama was groomed and prepared over a period of almost 30 years now, that Obama is there to frustrate and to deceive all of those hopes. Uh, Obama is a cruel hoax. He's a bogus sham. He's an absolute denial of everything that you'd expect from an, from an American president. It is very disturbing to see well-meaning people falling for high-tech propaganda over and over again. It happened after 9-11. The American people in mass were swept into a mob psychology, irrationally throwing their common sense to the wind and doing whatever the administration told them to. The general public eventually caught on to the fact that George W. Bush was a deceitful thug and that the economy was in free fall. In the midst of it all, Barack Obama was there, speaking out against the abuse of the people at the hands of the establishment. With the election of Barack Obama, the world rejoiced that the United States was no longer in the hands of madmen. But unfortunately for humanity, this was another vicious fraud. I want to like the guy. He speaks gently. He's intelligent. He, is, he seems to be a man of peace. He, he is just as charismatic as they come. But you know what? is that a tree is really, really measured by the quality of its fruit. And when you kind of put away all the flowery words, when you put away all the rhetoric, when you put away all the rock and roll music, what he does is what's important for the people of this country, starting with the truth. Obama is notoriously a liar. 
He promised that he would get out of Iraq, I think within 16 months at some point. We had Samantha Power telling the Scotsman uh, that he wouldn't be bound by those promises, and sure enough, he's now not going to be bound by those promises. Obama pledged in hundreds of speeches and interviews that within six months of being elected, he was going to bring our troops home from Iraq. But after he was inaugurated, the story changed. Now he said that they would look at bringing some of the troops home in 16 months. Two weeks later, his story had changed again. Now the administration would look at bringing the troops home in 23 months. Well, Obama's already fudging. He's yeah. fudged since day one in this election, where he first said we're getting out. Well, now it's a timetable, and now it's da da da, because they're getting to him. They're understanding that right. he, and he ain't going to be able to get him out because people more powerful than him got us in. When he first ran, remember, he was going to take the troops out. I get in there, troops come home. Day one. There is no military solution in Iraq, and there never was. I will begin to remove our troops from Iraq immediately. And then that went to 16 months. And now he's going to add, they're saying, another 30,000 or more troops to Afghanistan. Next, he sent 30,000 more Marines to Afghanistan, doubling the total number of forces in the crosshairs. Barack then announced that he was going to move missile systems into Eastern Europe to encircle Russia. But after all, what should we expect after he kept Bush's Secretary of Defense Robert Gates? The outcome of this policy is if you're constantly meddling near the Russian borders with these fascist creeps, IMF NATO agents like Yushchenko of Ukraine or Saakashvili of Georgia or these Kaczynski twins in Poland or various collections of people in Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, you're tied to these gangsters, and if they decide to start a war, that rapidly escalates into thermonuclear World War III. This is worse than the neocons. Bush and Cheney never got as far as Brzezinski, Soros, and the other people running Obama. Barack Obama swore that he would vote to repeal the Patriot Act, but then he voted for its reauthorization. Obama decried the Bush administration's illegal warrantless wiretapping of the American people. Then he voted to legalize it. Obama pledged that he would filibuster any attempt to give retroactive immunity to the telephone companies, the telecom companies, except he then turned around and voted for that bill. Most people don't know, for example, that he voted to reinstate the Patriot Act and more government wiretapping. Candidate Obama told desperate factory workers in speech after speech that he was going to renegotiate NAFTA and GATT to make it more fair for American workers. It is absolutely true that NAFTA was a mistake. But then his campaign was caught sending out memos to top corporate leaders telling them not to worry and that it was just campaign rhetoric. We had Obama saying, you know, I'm against free trade. I don't like NAFTA and all those free trade sellouts. We had Austin Goolsby going to the Canadian diplomats and saying, don't, don't mind him. He's just popping off. That's just election era rhetoric. Doesn't mean anything. Presidential candidate Barack Obama was publicly criticizing the North American Free Trade Agreement in a bid for votes, but privately telling Canadian officials not to worry about it. He said that he was going to bring us peace in the Middle East. He said that he was going to bring us transparency and a balanced economy. He said that he was going to not have, have lobbyists. He said he was going to clean up government. He said he was going to work for the environment. And point by point by point, within the first month of his inauguration, he has lied and deceived and cheat it, the American people. The people of the United States and the world were filled with hope that Obama was the real deal when in his first week in office he signed an executive order supposedly closing Guantanamo Bay and other secret prisons. Then the press actually had a chance to read the executive order and were shocked to find that the executive order only said that Obama was thinking about closing Guantanamo in a year. But worst of all, the executive order continued the practice of rendition, which the L.A. Times called secret abductions. They don't know. They think that he signed off immediately on closing Guantanamo. 
but he's allowing prisoners now to be taken to foreign countries and, and not knowing where they're sending them and to be tortured in foreign countries. They don't know that they kept that provision in there. Obama is now continuing the practice of secret arrest, secret prisons, and most importantly, indefinite detention without trial. When a British high court said that it was preparing to release secret British and U.S. torture orders that prove that the Bush administration was ordering personnel to systematically abuse detainees, Barack Obama threatened to cut off all U.S. intelligence ties to England. To add insult to injury, he stated that the program was important to national security, not only endorsing Bush's crimes, but continuing them. Obama voted for a reinstatement of the Patriot Act. And by his early deeds already again, as we saw with his, uh, his, the issues of retention, he's willing to send people that have been charged with nothing to be tortured to so-called get the truth out of them. If the makers of this film attempted to cover all of Obama's lies, this documentary would never be released because there are new ones every day. So in the interest of time, we're going to cover one more big one. Barack and his handlers made the cornerstone of his campaign, keeping lobbyists and donors out of his administration. Within hours of being elected, Obama did a 180 and filled the White House and federal government with lobbyists and donors at all levels. Obama picked William Lynn, the top lobbyist for Raytheon, to fill the number two position of the Department of Defense. Timothy Geithner former president of the private Federal Reserve Bank of New York, was picked by Obama to be Secretary of the Treasury. Geithner promptly crammed the Treasury Department full of lobbyists, like his chief of staff, Mark Patterson, formerly the top lobbyist at Goldman Sachs. Obama appointed top lobbyist to the Saudi royal family, George Mitchell, as the lead Middle Eastern envoy. Obama appointed the king of Wall Street lobbyist, Leon Panetta, to head up the CIA. Obama tapped Tom Daschle, top lobbyist for health care firms, to run the Department of Health and Human Services, and the list goes on and on. Then, three weeks into his administration, Obama launched a new lie, more outrageous than the previous. With Academy Award-level conviction, he said that he was upset about the banker bailout, which his own chief of staff, Rahm Emanuel, another former Wall Street executive, had engineered. Obama said that he had signed an executive order capping the CEO's salaries of those who had taken the bailout money. There was just two problems. All the major banks and brokerage firms were exempt, and the new order only dealt with any future bailouts. And those were to be on the honor system. What gets people upset, and rightfully so, are executives being rewarded for failure. AIG, Bank of America, and Citigroup, which have received billions in bailout money, don't fall under this plan. Only banks negotiating future agreements with the government will be restricted. But this appears to be built on an honor system, and White House Press Secretary Robert Gibbs had a hard time explaining how enforcement would work. Well, let, let, let me get, uh, I, I will get uh, clarification from Treasurer on that. Generally speaking, this is already the biggest liar and the biggest disappointment that we've seen in recent history. And again, qualitatively beyond the rather low standards set by Bush the Elder and Clinton in terms of delivering on, on promises. Bottom line, Obama is a fantastic actor and an even better liar. His track record is clear. He has done the opposite of everything he told the people he would do. They'll make up one lie after another. And if you believe these people, knock yourself out. I don't believe a word they say. Within one month of the passage of the first banker bailout bill, the press reported that over $5 trillion had just disappeared out of the U.S. Treasury. By December, the amount of money that had been stolen had reached $8.5 trillion. The leadership of both political circled the wagons and would not discuss where the money had gone. In the bed, in the bed, in the bed, in the bed.
informed Americans protested the private Federal Reserve System at all 38 of their regional governorship offices. Arrest Bernanke and Paulson! Arrest all the criminals that stole the Baker bailout money! It was refreshing to see people standing up against the real power structure, not being distracted by the elite's front men like George W. Bush and Barack Obama. We traveled to Dallas, Texas to cover We the People taking on the real enemy. Hey, I want to talk to the workers up there on the parapet. I want smoking cigarettes and just jump back. You're, you're with the American people, we know that, but understand, as the workers inside, you're not in a federal government building, you're in a private federal reserve that uses that name as a fraud. That'd be like if my first name was Federal Reserve Jones. I'm still not the federal government. I'm not a federal agency. But if I said my name was Federal Reserve, I could go out and pay off politicians and get them to allow me to get into power so I could issue the currency and credit, and then I could buy up the world. That's what these criminals have done. A lot of people think that the Federal Reserve is already part of the government. They're not. It's controlled by cliques of unelected, unaccountable bankers meeting in secret. Most of these people have never even been through the formality of a Senate hearing or a Senate confirmation. They claim that they're part of the U.S. Uh, government. They masquerade as if they were part of the U.S. government. But in reality, this is a purely private operation. Jackals, hyenas, raptors, all of them loyal, not to the American people, but to the Wall Street banks, which is where most of them come from. Everyone is pointing to Barack right now, President Obama, as saying, you got to get the economy together. You got to get the economy together. When in fact, the president has very little to do with the economy. It's the Federal Reserve Chairman that at least sets the policy. That's a privately owned company, the Federal Reserve Bank. They set the agenda. These guys are masquerading as a federal institution. They are a private banking consortium, and this is their front, their holding company. The Federal Reserve is not federal. It's a front for a private banking cartel that's on record in congressional testimony, and they're the ones orchestrating the economic collapse we're seeing right now, so that's why we're here. While at the In the Fed rally outside the Federal Reserve Bank in Dallas, Texas, we spoke with Ron Paul's brother, Wayne Paul. 1913, the Federal Reserve Act was passed floor of the House where three members of Congress were on the floor. At that time, they only needed a majority of votes to pass it. So in 1913, the Federal Reserve Act was passed. Twenty years later, 1933, under Roosevelt, the United States was declared bankrupt. And in 1933, the Federal Reserve Private Bank says, okay, USA, what are you going to pledge as collateral on the debt you owe me? What happened by 1936? Does anybody know? We instituted Social Security system, and you and I and our children and our children's children were pledged as collateral on the debt of our government to the Federal Reserve. And that's where we're at today. It took 20 years to make this country bankrupt, and since then, our government has operated under emergency powers of our government. It is not the president that makes the decision in this country. It's the Secretary of Treasury who turns around and is put in there by the Federal Reserve to manage the bankruptcy. We've been in bankruptcy ever since. So to print $700 billion and to give it away, how do they get away with it? The manager of the bankruptcy is told by the Federal Reserve this is the way to go. That's where we're at today. Yes, we should point out, Congressman Ron Paul now has a huge amount of sponsors for a bill in the House of Representatives to abolish the private Federal Reserve crime syndicate. In 1913, the money power of the country was taken away from the people by constitutional privilege it belongs with the Congress, but it was given up in the Federal Reserve Act. The Federal Reserve is no more federal than Federal Express, but yet it has the power to determine the direction of use of money in our economy. 
if we could take that power back and put the federal reserve under treasury we start to be in a position of being able to control monetary policy on behalf of the united states people the federal reserve is totally private and alan greenspan two weeks ago on pbs on lair news hour said on record that they are above the law the congress the president everyone no court can do anything we run america what is the uh, proper relationship, what should be the proper relationship between a chairman of the Fed and a president of the United States? Well, first of all, the Federal Reserve is an independent agency, and that means basically that uh, there is no ag other agency of government which can overrule actions that we take. So long as that is in place, and there is no evidence that the administration or the Congress or anybody else is uh, requesting that we do things other than what we think is the appropriate thing, then what the relationships are uh, don't frankly matter. Notice what Greenspan is saying. Greenspan is saying the Federal Reserve is beyond the law, and in reality they are in practice beyond the law. Nobody, as far as I know, has ever audited the Federal Reserve. One of the first things we ought to do when we nationalize the Fed is go in there and find out the audit. Who stole money? Who engaged in corruption? There's a whole series of people going back to Volcker, to Greenspan, to Bernanke, uh, and so forth. Think of the arrogance of a private group of banks that have bankrupted the nation by design so they can repo the country. A private group of banks that loaned us our own money back are telling us they're above the law. That's you right. are not above the law, criminals. No one is above the law. No one is above the law, and the private Federal Reserve sure as hell isn't either. Since the, the founding of the Federal Reserve back under Woodrow Wilson, uh, the Federal Reserve has struck out three times. They didn't stop the crash of 1929, they didn't stop the banking panic of 1932-1933, and now they are the cause of the derivatives crisis because they're the ones who inflicted derivatives on the world with Alan Greenspan. Instead of our economy being about goods and services and real products and manufacturing, it's all about these guys, the private Federal Reserve that masquerades as a government entity who controls the issuance of currency and credit. They're the ones that have cut off the liquidity in the market. They told us have a debt-based economy. Then they cut it off once they get us under their thumb and implode the economy so they can consolidate it. And that's what they're doing right now. I mean, it's, it's in their own documents. It's in their own statements. They claim, give us unlimited power, give us trillions of dollars with the banker bailout bill that's already $5 trillion, not $850 billion, as they say, uh, and, and we'll get the economy going. But they're hoarding the money and buying up other banks that aren't part of the Federal Reserve, buying up insurance companies, buying up roads, infrastructures, media empires, defense contractors. What the banks do is they implode an economy by cutting off uh, credit, and then once things really fall to a low, and they know the low because then they buy everything up, and start then putting more money back into the economy and then they build it back up. So they build us up and then shear us, build us up and shear us. And they're getting ready. All over the world they're always shearing some country, imploding it. Comes out in their own IMF and World Bank documents. That's just the foreign arm of the same cartel. And these are the people who claim to be the saviors of the economy, the people who have created every important crisis in the past hundred years, the Federal Reserve. So it's illegal, it's unconstitutional, and it's a failure. And I think the failure is what everybody can see right now. Yeah, what they do is that they make you think Clinton's evil in running things, and then, oh, Bush will save us, and then, oh, Bush was evil. Uh, now we'll be saved by Barack Obama, but he's just a puppet. But as we get deeper into this phase, uh, w when they implode the economy, they have all the money and all the control, and th but they also like to pose as the savior. So Obama is meant to be the savior during the Depression, and he'll save us with a million person. He said it's bigger, bigger than our military, domestic spy force, a three million person environmental spy force. So giving people these jobs to be government bureaucrats and spies to go out and manage uh, the other uh, you know, 290 something million Americans. And so this is classical fascism. The communists also do it. Any vertically integrated command and control authoritarian system does this. So they're openly following what the same group of banks did in Germany, Russia. You know, it's in the Communist Manifesto to have a private central bank because the private central bankers actually wrote the ideas that they had Marx and Engels put out. People go, well, why would the banks want communism? It doesn't exist. 
they rape us, they consolidate us, they put us into work brigades, they make us slaves, and they say it's a people's paradise. Look at it, boy, you're really doing good. And then they transfer all the wealth of the nation offshore. The globalists are outside all the nations. That gives them safety, and they play countries off against each other. And so that's what we're facing and dealing with. And so they're bringing in classical, hardcore tyranny in the U.S. But we have the Internet. We've grown our numbers. The alternative media has exploded. That's what they're trying to move in to shut down and regulate and tax the web. But it's too late for them. Uh, they're, they're playing in the 19th century, 20th century rules. It's the 21st century the century of resistance to tyranny. And so it's going to be one hell of a fight uh, with the people and free humanity on one side and the New World Order on the other. And every one of you out there counts, needs to be involved in this fight like nothing you've been involved with before because this is life and death. It depends on exposing these people. Everything depends on showing the people that this is the New World Order, this is the criminals. We're dealing with the king rats here, the people that are carrying out tyranny worldwide. And either they fall or we fall. Either worldwide darkness and a new age of tyranny and oppression and, with a scientific overlay or a new age of liberty and freedom and, and a new renaissance. The choice, the choice is the people's out there. Okay, we can tell you what's going on. You can check it out for yourself and find out it's true. But don't wait. Investigate now. Get involved now. Go out there and reach out now. We don't have time. If you're looking for the solution, look in the mirror. Look right into the mirror because you out there, men, women, old, young, black, white, doesn't matter. It's going to be up to you if they win or if liberty succeeds and the people have a chance of having any future. These are cold-blooded eugenicists. These are cold-blooded people who think they're God, think that they're our masters, that think that we're animals. These are the guys that funded Lenin and Stalin and Hitler and Mao. These are the guys, it's all on record, that bankroll this stuff. They are hardcore vicious and they must be resisted. Up until about... The Kennedy assassination and the beginning of the war in Vietnam, the United States is a very powerful engine for world progress. It's the assassinations, the Kennedy assassination and the others in the 1960s, the beginning of the Vietnam War and the beginning of the absolute domination of the Wall Street group over every other interest. Nobody else counts except the Wall Street money masters. That has now made the United States into uh, no longer a force for progress, but something very different, often a force for destruction in the world. That doesn't need to remain that way. The interest of the American people is to fight to take your government back from Wall Street and make the United States a force for progress in the world, which we easily could do if we could just break the power of the people behind Obama. The main banks of Europe, which were started by Adam Weishaupt and, and, and Rothschild, the Bank Nationale de Paris, the Bank of England, the, the Bank of Italy, have all financed the messianic and, and, and war leaders of the last 200 years. Napoleon, Lenin, Stalin, they backed Adolf Hitler, they backed Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and they are backing right now Barack Obama. The banking cartel had established a beachhead in 1913 through the Federal Reserve Act. In 1947 they set up a parallel shadow government through the National Security Act. From 47 on, the national security state began the long process of absorbing federal and state bureaucracies, while at the same time undermining the constitutional power of Congress and dominating the executive branch. By controlling the issuance of currency and credit, the private Federal Reserve was able to buy up most of the Fortune 500. And if a company wouldn't sell, the bankers would unleash federal regulators to run them out of business. Private central banks in Europe, the United States and England, took taxpayer money and loaned it at over 30% interest to third world nations. The bankers would then bribe the leaders of those countries not to pay back the loans. Their third world puppets would sign agreements stating that when the country defaulted, the banks would be given all the natural resources and infrastructure of the once sovereign lands. But worst of all, the countries would pledge future taxes paid by the people in perpetuity as profit to the private banks. By the year 2000, there were few nations that had not fallen to the designs of the money power. The globalists were now ready to start their final phase of world government takeover, the destruction of the Western nations' economies. To carry out their final takeover, 
they first removed banking regulations like the Glass-Steagall Act in the late 1990s. This allowed their front companies to issue unlimited credit to the world and to set up colossal Ponzi schemes, the likes of which the world had never seen. The scams were advertised by the controlled corporate media as completely legitimate. Because of the fantastic returns, private investors, corporations, state and local governments invested heavily. They had taken the bait, hook, line and sinker. To destroy confidence, in late 2007, the bankers themselves began to badmouth the scams they had created. Next, the central bankers cut off the tsunami of fiat money that they had been using to pump up the bubble. When Congress and the public refused to write the finance oligarchs a blank check, the bankers began to engage in financial terrorism. They said that the world would go into another Great Depression unless their demands were met, further destroying confidence. The stock market instantly had its biggest one-day loss in history, but even that wasn't enough to force Congress to capitulate to the offshore banks. Senator Inhofe of Oklahoma and Congressman Brad Sherman of California, amongst others, told the world that the entire Congress had been threatened with martial law by the White House and the Treasury Department if they didn't pass the so-called banker bailout bill. The only way they can pass this bill is by creating and sustaining a panic atmosphere. That atmosphere is not justified. Many of us were told in private conversations that if we voted against this bill on Monday that the sky would fall, the market would drop two or three thousand points the first day, another couple thousand the second day, and a few members were even told that there would be martial law in America if we voted no. That's what I call fear-mongering. Unjustified. The final version of the bill was kept secret from the Congress until minutes before the vote on October 3, 2008. The Federal Reserve had promised total transparency, that every dime would be accounted for. To Democrats and Republicans who've opposed this plan, I say, step up to the plate. Let's do what's right for the country at this time, because the time to act is now. To prevent the possibility of a crisis turning into a catastrophe. After its passage, the public learned with horror that the bill was really a financial coup d'etat by Wall Street. The bill didn't just give $700 billion to the banks. It was a blank check. And as of February 2009, $9.7 trillion has disappeared into a black hole. Within 24 hours of its passage, Secretary of Treasury Henry Paulson said they were no longer going to use the money to unfreeze the mortgage market by buying bad debt. We went to Congress. The illiquid assets look like the way to go. As the situation worsened, the facts change. I will never apologize for, for changing an approach or strategy when the facts change. Paulson has, in the meantime, admitted that the subprime mortgage crisis is not the cause, really, of the breakdown of the entire world banking system and the bankruptcy of most of the banks in London and in, uh, in Wall Street. He said, oh, we're going to buy up toxic assets, but we're not going to worry about subprime mortgages. What he's talking about is derivatives. Derivatives are the center of the crisis. He went on to say that where the money was going was a secret. I believe that banking institutions are more dangerous to our liberties than standing armies. If the American people ever allow private banks to control the issuance of their currency, first by inflation, then by deflation, the banks and corporations that will grow up around the banks will deprive the people of all property until their children wake up homeless on the continent their fathers conquered. The issuing power should be taken from the banks and restored to the people to whom it properly belongs. Thomas Jefferson, third president of the United States. Secretary Paulson came in with the vice president and uh, Fed Chairman Bernanke and made all these assurances that there was absolutely a critical, immediate need to get rid of the corrosive derivative products, you know, all the different names for this 
and you know ubiquitous you know uh, sub s retraded credit default swap blah 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 okay but they they talked about them as though they knew what the hell they were you got the money and you immediately said what items what auction now the treasury just just basically cut that out of the bill and what you know what we have here is a situation where uh, banks are, are hoarding the money that they're getting from the TARP. They're using the money to purchase other banks. And all of a sudden, the Treasury sent a signal to the banks, forget about it. We're going to give you the money that you want, and you do what you want with it. Unless you direct it specifically, it's not going to happen. I don't think anyone questions, Mr. Kashkari, that you're working hard. Our question is who you're working for. Throughout its passage, President Bush and Senator Obama worked in tandem to get Congress to pass the bill without even having time to read it, despite the fact that in major polls, 98% of the American people were against the bill. The leadership in both parties were for it. And I really want to commend Barack Obama because as we were involved in the this and that and different provisions of the bill to persuade people, he really gave them confidence that this was the right decision uh, for the American people, even though it wasn't, in our view, a great bill uh, for them to vote on. I want to take a particular moment to also thank the individual who's not here, and that is Barack Obama, who made numerous calls not only to all of us, but the members of our caucus and helped us gather the votes on the Democratic side to pass this legislation. Bank heads then bragged to the press that they were hoarding the bailout money and using it to buy up smaller healthy banks and insurance companies. Their plan was working like a charm. Next, the central bankers loaned the federal government back $787 billion of our own money at interest for President Obama's so-called stimulus package. And just like the banker bailout, Congress was given less than an hour to read the 1,070 page plus stimulus bill. Barack Obama, who had pledged on the campaign trail to wait five days before a bill could be voted on so that the Congress and the people could have a chance to read it, said that the stimulus was too important and it had to be passed before anybody could see it or read it, or the crisis would turn into a catastrophe. Doing little or nothing at all will result in either, even greater deficits, even greater job loss, even greater loss of income, and even greater loss of confidence. Those are deficits that could turn a crisis into a catastrophe, and I refuse to let that happen. After its Friday passage, in gangster fashion, President Barack Obama took a four-day vacation and said that there was no rush to sign it. The spending bill was really a takeover bill, designed to further federalize the states and to pay off rich donors that had donated to both parties. As the world slid deeper into depression, the bankers celebrated the fire sale that they had created. I believe this, the phrase, burdens of the office, is overstated. Yes, can I? Now, why me? Oh, the burdens, you know. Why, why did the financial collapse have to happen on my watch? It's just pathetic, isn't it? Self-pity. And, and I don't believe uh, a president-elect Obama will be full of self-pity. With their access to unlimited fiat capital, they could now buy up sectors of the world economy not already controlled by them. For over a century, the Anglo-American establishment had worked to bring the world system to this point. Artificially engineered global bankruptcy. In an address before the Trilateral Commission in June of 1991, David Rockefeller laid out the elite's ultimate goal the supranational sovereignty of an intellectual elite and world bankers is surely preferable to the national autodetermination practice in the last centuries. Now that the bankers were holding the world hostage, they issued their ultimatum. The only solution to restart the global economy would be to set up a planetary government ruled by a new bank of the world. A bank of the world 
owned and controlled by them. Suddenly, hundreds of prominent publications announce the solution, the people's only salvation. Time Magazine, in an article titled The New World Order, said that the new super bank would control the world's currencies and set interest rates, and that the new bank would, quote, knock the heads of bad countries, like the United States. At a meeting of central bank heads and finance ministers dubbed Bretton Woods II, the plan for world government was unveiled by the very bankers that had engineered the collapse. Formerly sovereign countries would now pay their taxes directly to the banking cartel. Hundreds of new carbon taxes controlling every facet of human activity would only be the beginning. Now all the elite had to do was to sell the public on accepting the final phase of their takeover. And it's Obama's job to sucker the public into standing down so the banker's agenda can move forward unhindered. Never before in U.S. history has the media gotten behind a president like they are behind Obama. The press has pulled out all the stops, bestowing a crown of infallibility upon Obama as the savior of the people. The elite are betting everything they've got on Obama's charisma and hoping that he can sell the world on their program of tyranny. Yes, there have been differences between America and Europe. No doubt there will be differences in the future. But the burdens of global citizenship continue to bind us together. A change of leadership in Washington will not lift this burden. In this new century, Americans and Europeans alike will be required to do more, not less. Partnership and cooperation among nations is not a choice. It is the only way. We've got to give them a stake in creating the kind of uh, uh, world order that I think all of us would like to see. In truth, Obama is not simply continuing George W. Bush's policies. He is radically expanding them. I thank President Bush for his service to our nation. This film has documented the painful fact that Barack Obama's agenda is the complete opposite of what he has claimed it to be. Now we will reveal what Barack Obama and his controllers' true agenda is. Number one, bring the United States under the complete regulatory control of a private offshore superbank known as the Bank of the World. More than a hundred new taxes are now being developed under the umbrella of curbing greenhouse gases. The new taxes will be paid directly to the private bank consortium. At the producer level, taxes will be paid on farm animals flatulence. At the consumer level, there will be carbon taxes on all forms of meat, beef, poultry, pork and fish. All cars will be fitted with satellite tracking boxes that will tax driving by the mile and an added tax will be placed on all fossil fuels, including motor oil and natural gas. All plastic products will have a carbon tax added. Outdoor space heaters and fireplaces are to be taxed. All electricity produced by coal-powered plants will be taxed. Under the cap-and-trade system, citizens will be forced to pay taxes on thousands of products to private cap-and-trade services owned by Al Gore and other elitists. There will be taxes on light bulbs, water, trash pickup, air travel, train travel, bus, ship, medicine, steel production, mining, clothing, laundry, asphalt, are just a few of the new taxes to be levied. But to truly transform our economy, to protect our security and save our planet from the ravages of climate change, we need to ultimately make clean, renewable energy the profitable kind of energy. So I ask this Congress to send me legislation that places a market-based cap on carbon pollution and drives the production of more renewable energy in America. That's what we need. The notion of anthropogenic global warming is a fraud. In other words, the idea that the planet is getting warmer and that human activity is somehow responsible is a pseudo-scientific fraud. It's a big lie. It's a monstrosity. Remember the Nazis, they had race science, race hygiene. They said Aryan blood is different from any other kind of blood. This was, of course, idiocy, a fantastic piece of nonsense. 
Today, we've got something similar. Global warming caused by human activity, and the answer to that is carbon tax plus cap and trade, according to the wishes of Al Gore, Prince Charles, and basically the entire uh, world uh, banking community, the world oligarchy. What they're trying to do with that is to perpetuate the current system where bankers rule the world, financiers rule the world, and the rest of us get the crumbs from the table. But remember, if you try to put on cap and trade and a global warming uh, carbon tax with the idea that you're going to save the polar bears, what you're going to do is destroy human society. You're going to cause genocide on a massive scale. The deaths will be measured in the hundreds of millions and indeed in the billions. Just the idea of global warming means that there'll be no development for Africa, no development for the poorer parts of Southeast Asia, and no world economic recovery of any kind ever in our entire lifetime. So it's important to expose and fight the pseudoscientific fraud of global warming. One more point about this. You don't need a climatologist to know that this stuff is a fraud. I'm a historian. I can tell you. In the last thousand years, we had a period of very warm temperatures called the medieval warm period, where all kinds of grapes and uh, semi-tropical stuff were growing very far into the northern hemisphere. That was about 1100, 1200. It happened to correspond with an all-time um, maximum of sunspots. Right now, we can say that we're going into another maximum period where there'll be some warming, but we're well within the limits of the medieval warm period. About uh, 1600 to 1650, there was an ice age in northern Europe. The North Sea was filled with ice. The German and Dutch ports and the English ports were filled with ice. That corresponds to an all-time minimum of sunspot activity, the Spürer minimum and the Maunder minimum. So, this has largely got to do with solar activity. We can see that other planets, not just the Earth, are warming slightly as a result of increased solar activity. But we're well within the minimum. So what the oligarchs claim to be an open and shut scientific case is a piece of pseudoscientific nonsense, and it should be rejected. Number two, the social engineers are fully aware that the Obama craze will wear off quickly. So they are racing to put in place the most oppressive police state control grid in human history. 20,000 battle-hardened regular army troops are now being deployed to patrol the streets of the United States. FEMA is now building giant camps in every country. And the Congress has introduced bills like the National Emergency Centers Act, H.R. 645, which merges local governments and the police under federal control. And as we all know that have watched these things, they're ready for the riots. With these detention centers that are being opened up around the country, with state police training for riot control in the, in the event of economic calamity and food riots, they know what's going on and they're prepared for it. So people better also prepare for it themselves. Anyone that's not prepared for what's going to happen, they deserve what they get. Because there's enough information out there pointing to the problems. And they should take all precautionary actions. Next, Obama ordered the Defense Department to issue DOD Directive 1404.10, establishing a one million person civilian army under his control. Simultaneously, Obama launched USAService.org. The new website deceptively masquerades as a federal agency, but in reality is a recruiting tool building a separate, completely private army outside of government that takes orders directly from Obama's controllers. Barack Obama has refused to rescind Presidential Decision Directive 51, signed by George W. Bush. The directive plainly states, the president is a dictator and that Congress is ceremonial. We cannot continue to rely only on our military in order to achieve the national security objectives that we've set. We've got to have a civilian national security force that's just as powerful, just as strong, just as well-funded. President Obama and his Chief of Staff, Rahm Emanuel, 
have repeatedly stated on the record that all Americans below the age of 64 will be forcibly conscripted into federal service. Citizenship is not an entitlement program. It comes with responsibilities. Everybody somewhere between the ages of 18 and 25 will serve three months of basic training and understanding in a kind of civil defense. Now, it doesn't always have to be uh, service in uniform. One of the things that if you talk to our generals, they are desperate for is a civilian uh, counterpart to our military forces. So is this compulsory then? Uh, well, you have to, uh, in a sense, it's a required of everybody, 18 to 25, three months, uh, and at some point at that point you do it. Obviously I'm not going to say perfect legislation, we'll work that process through. You can do it during a college right. summer, you right. can do it after Any high school. If you have a demagogue with a fanatical mass movement of personality cultists who is imposing the program of a group of extreme bankers and finance oligarchs, that's fascism. Obama's transition site, change.gov, proclaimed that middle school and high school students will be forced to serve the federal government. Fascism is gutter up, streets up, hooligans, thugs, fervently idealistic students, swarming adolescents, just the kind of thing you see around Obama. The way you get a population to enslave itself when the police and the army are no longer enough to do that. So I think that's, that's uh, if you're a left liberal, uh, it's time to open your eyes to that. All young Americans between the ages of 18 and 24 will be conscripted into a paramilitary domestic security force. If Obama has his way, adults and seniors will also be forced into other forms of service for the betterment of the homeland. Number three, disarming the American people. Obama operatives in the Congress have introduced more than 10 bills that would end the Second Amendment as we know it. H.R. 1022 would allow the new Attorney General Eric Holder the dictatorial power to ban any gun he wishes at will. In 2008 before the Supreme Court, in the D.C. gun ban case, District of Columbia versus Heller, Holder argued for the complete disarmament of the American people and that only the military should own firearms. H.R. 257 would ban all youth shooting sports, including YMCA and Youth Olympic Shooting Clubs. H.R. 45 would force all gun owners to undergo federal psychological screening, registration and testing to keep their firearms. White House Chief of Staff Rahm Emanuel has proposed the extrajudicial banning of any American on the fraudulent no-fly list from owning any firearm. That is, if you are on the no-fly list because you are known as maybe a possible terrorist, you cannot buy a handgun in America. Over 25,000 Americans are added each month to the no-fly list, which numbers over a million people who have not been charged or convicted of any crime. It's a case of mistaken identity for a five-year-old boy from Normandy Park. He had trouble boarding a plane because someone with his same name is wanted by the federal government. King 5's Mimi Jung is live at SeaTac Airport to explain. Mimi. Lori, it's hard to believe that a five-year-old could be considered a threat, but that's exactly what happened here at SeaTac last week when Matthew Gardner showed up for a flight to LAX. And a friend. As five-year-olds go, Matthew Gardner is about as harmless as you can get. But when he and his mom checked in for their flight at SeaTac last week, Matthew was considered the criminal. If you're on that no-fly list, your access to the right to bear arms is canceled because you're not part of the American family. You don't deserve that right. There is no right for you if you're on that terrorist list. And even though this Matthew Gardner is only in kindergarten, TSA workers still conducted a full-blown search. Here they searched all of our belongings. They took everything apart piece by piece. Um, Nadia Counter says it wasn't easy being treated as a possible threat to national security. I picked up my child to give him a hug and tell him, you know, it's okay, we're doing fine. And they reported to me that I was not allowed to touch him. He was a security risk, and um, they had to re-search me to make sure that I had not um, obtained any materials from him. Number four, massive restrictions on the First Amendment guarantee of free speech. The President, Congress, and the FCC have announced plans to not only curtail speech on talk radio and newspapers, but to also regulate speech on the Internet 
to the Orwellian named Fairness Doctrine. The Obama machine is also pressuring Congress to pass draconian hate speech laws that will eviscerate the First Amendment. Number five, they plan to further federalize health care so that the government can dictate what kind of care citizens receive. Modeled after the British system, this includes rationing care and restricting what procedures the handicapped and elderly are eligible for. Number six, Obama is already pushing to expand the Department of Defense budget and to station more U.S. troops overseas to encircle Russia, China, Iran, as well as setting up bases in Africa under the pretext of humanitarian aid and dominate and occupy Africa through AFRICOM. So we're taking your phone call, seeing what you think of Barack H. Obama. Is he a Judas goat? Is he a front man? Is he a betrayer? Let's go to Anthony in Georgia. Anthony, what's your take on Barack Obama? Uh, they put the face of Barack Obama as uh, part of their their public relations because it's like the old folk tales about vampires. A vampire cannot force his way into somebody's house. It gets, it's against some kind of metaphysical law. So the vampire has to persuade the resident of the household to open the door and invite him in. So they're going to look at the peephole at Barack Obama, which looks like them and appears to be on their side. They're going to say, okay, here's my ally. Let me open the door and let me let uh, this person in. And then Barack Obama is just, of course, a front man for the American empire where he's going to have the entire U.S. Navy, the entire U.S. Army, and the entire U.S. Marines under AFRICOM command. And, of course, he's going to turn it into a new Iraq, and he's going to turn it into a new Afghanistan. Everything, every operation that you see going on in Iraq and Afghanistan is going to propagate to the uh, poor countries of Africa. And well, sir, sir, I agree with you. sir, I agree with you. They're looking to the people. They see a handsome, smiling African face. You know, he's all, hey, I'm from Kenya. And then it's a total bait and switch. But it's the same thing here in the United States where they would get sell-out uh, Native American chiefs to sell out their people. This is the right. oldest trick in the book. And he can also pacify uh, uh, the most downtrodden minority groups in the United States. And he's saying, hey, get ready for sacrifice. Get ready to lose your standard of living. They're like, yay, I love Obama. They could never get away with this with a John McCain. Obama basically does uh, a couple of things. One is, again, this idea, kick the Chinese out of Africa. Kick them out of Sudan where they get oil. Kick them out of Zimbabwe where they get raw materials. Start a civil war in Congo, another big source of raw materials. Al-Qaeda, an arm of uh, the U.S. intelligence community, is now active in Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco. You've got a destabilization going on in Kenya around Odinga. That's Obama's cousin. This is a guy who has two uh, children. They're Obama's niece and, uh, well, nephew in a broad sense. Uh, and one of them is named Raul, and the other one is named Winnie, after Winnie Mandela, who did the necklacing and political assassinations in South Africa. So this... Odinga is essentially a CIA destabilizing operation in Kenya, and he's got a Odinga Islamic alliance to crush the Christians in, in Kenya, but this also reaches into uh, Ethiopia, it reaches into Uganda, Congo, Tanzania, and a whole bunch of other countries in that region. So all of Africa is a battlefield in flames between the U.S. and the Chinese, with Obama leading the charge to kick the Chinese out for geopolitical reasons. Number seven, radically expand federal control over family farms and ranches through the animal ID and premises ID system. Number eight, accelerate the merger of the United States with Canada and Mexico under the Security and Prosperity Partnership. He is also accelerating the transfer of remaining federal authority to unelected quasi-governmental bodies like the World Trade Organization. Number nine, Obama must convincingly play the part of the president and convince the people of the United States that the buck actually stops with him. This is critical to the globalist master plan because in four to eight years, Obama must take the blame, as Bush did, for the New World Order's horrific agenda. At that point, the elite will put a new puppet in the ceremonial seat of power and build him up as the savior, only to tear them down again. And so the process is repeated over and over. For their program to work, 
it is essential that the people not learn that the presidency is now nothing more than theater. Because if they did, the people would stop looking at the pawns and start looking for the king. Through this system of deceit, the elite's criminal agenda can continue forever because the people waste all of their political energy debating the media spectacle instead of investigating the globalist agenda. Number 10. It's Obama's job to sell the public on globalist policies that aren't in the people's best interest. But the overlords have many salesmen. His most important function is to protect the criminal oligarchs from prosecution while they loot the economy worldwide, start new wars, and engage in torture. They're called Generation O, and they were the key to Barack Obama's White House win. Campaign, Barack Obama used the internet like no other candidate before him, harnessing the energy of millions of his supporters. But the question now is, what to do with this young, eager, energetic army? This gives Barack Obama and his administration contact information for so many people. So next time he needs to push his legislation, he can contact all these people. Kennedy-esque. I feel as though this was like when John F. Kennedy was elected. Shouting, smiles, and tears. It was the scope of Obama's victory that was most impressive. I saw a photograph of Obama playing basketball. And I said, you know what? I see him as a leader. And that's the world that's in his hands. Known a piece of history, commemorating the day the world changed forever. His confident smile and kind eyes are an inspiration to us all. In summation, Barack Obama is a Madison Avenue created fad. All of the crazed Obama worship being pushed by the corporate media is scientifically designed to capture the public in a net of peer pressure mass euphoria. If the New World Order can just distract the public for a few more years, the elite can finish constructing their police state control grid. Now, a lot of times, we don't want to know the issue. Right. We don't want to know the issue. We feel, what do you call this thing where you get this false sense of gratification, but because a black man is in office, everything's going to be all right. No, everything's not going to be all right. Yeah. Until you look into the agenda and what the Democratic Party has been about, is about, and will be about, regardless if Barack Obama is the president or not. And that's real. Barack Obama is the perfect Trojan horse. He makes the people feel like they finally have a place at the table, even as he betrays them. I won't have to worry about paying my mortgage. Oh, it's such a blessing to see you, Mr. President. Thank you for taking time out of your day. Never in my life would think that this would ever happen. Sadly, many Obama supporters can't see what's right in front of their faces because they've already invested their very identity in this artificially created cult movement. Throughout history, it has happened over and over again. People turn their intellect over to cult of personality mass movements, and it's happening again. The evidence presented in this film is documented fact, and those that ignore what history has taught us do so at the peril of us all. As frightening as the information in this film is, there are many things we can do to stop the globalist agenda dead in its tracks. First, we expose the cult of Obama for what it is, a sad hoax. Next, realize that we are all being propagandized 24-7. Investigate all information for yourself, be it political parties, the media, or this film. Be aware of the tricks that the elite use, like the staging of false flag terror attacks and other crises. Rediscover the Constitution and Bill of Rights. Promote a culture of true liberty. There is a reason the internationalists are attempting to destroy the sovereignty of all 50 states. They know it is one of the biggest threats to their domination. The federal government has been completely hijacked by foreign interest and more than 25 states have recognized this fact 
and are moving to block the New World Order at the state level by declaring their Tenth Amendment powers. But most important of all, there is a huge awakening taking place in the United States and across the world against the globalist agenda. Free people everywhere are joining together and saying no to corruption and tyranny and no to world government. This is the center of endurance and endurance is what wins wars. Not how many people you kill, but how long can you endure? George Washington lost almost every battle he had, but he endured. He out endured the British. And that's how the battle was won, endurance. And each and every one of you watching this, every single one of you, is just as important as the people who were our founding fathers, as that you are just as important as the Sons of Liberty who met in the 1770s to, to philosophize about freedom, to philosophize about a republic, to philosophize about a truly free country with a republic. There's a billion people on the planet. It only take one to change it. Are you the one? There may be everybody in your classroom bugging out. Your whole school may be on fire with kids wild and bringing guns at. But are you the one? Nature has a way of abundance. Nature puts out a lot of stuff looking for the one. So if you're going to go along with the trend of let's just kill each other, let's disrespect each other, then you're part of nature's plan as well to be part of just the, 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 the excess. But if you think more of yourself than just being the excess, you'll do more for yourself. Are you the one? Everybody's not going to make it. But you have an opportunity to save yourself. Well, we don't have to look back thousands or even hundreds of years to see how dangerous this present day situation is. We can look back to Bolshevik Russia. We can see the takeover by the Bolsheviks talking about the people's revolution, talking about the positive change. And Lenin came in and then Stalin. The fact is, is that over 40 million Russians between 1925 and 1940 good Russian, people who were Christians, people who had who had their own businesses, people who were educated, they were exterminated because they had their own business, because they were educated, because they believed, believed in God's law. We can look over at Germany. Germany was in a very, very terrible economic situation and this very charismatic leader called Adolf Hitler comes in. He, he, he makes the roads good and he promises a better life for the people. And within 10 years, you see a completely nationalized, centralized, dictatorial situation where millions and millions of people were exterminated. And then we can go to Maoist China. Mao came in, he, he promised change, he promised a better life. And within five years, 60 million Chinese were exterminated. They don't teach that. They don't teach that in the schools these days. And it wasn't that long ago. And I pray, pray, pray to God that this will not happen in the United States. And the way it won't happen is if you and your friends and all of us together take action to say no. This country is too precious. It's too wonderful. It's, it's too good of a place to lay down as a victim. Greatness could arise once we break the shackles of the government that's holding us back. One thing America has more than any other country is an entrepreneurial spirit. One thing we have more than any other country is the ability to be innovators. You know, if I was born in Italy, I wouldn't be the trend forecaster I am today because I would have been locked into a culture of thinking one way. We have that freedom of expression and freedom of thought that could free us to create greatness again if if Big Brother doesn't come down on us harder. Humankind is at a historic crossroads. The forces of globalism are marching towards absolute despotism. Look in the mirror, count the cost, and decide, 
Are you going to let history repeat itself? Will you stand tall with freedom lovers everywhere and stop the completion of a world dictatorship?